Father God, we thank you for being that God. Thank you for loving us. Loving us just like we are, but too much to let us stay that way. Father, today we are blessed to be able to be privileged to come to your house and worship. To sing the songs of praise, to give of our tithes and our offerings, to read from the very word of God. So, Father, thank you for this privilege that I have of standing in a pulpit that Jesus Christ died on a cross to defend. For a plan that he died on a cross to offer. And, Father, may we constantly love you and never forget what you've done for us. And may that compel us to do for you. Father, we thank you for protecting us last Sunday from the storms that came over, touched down on either side of us. We pray for those people that were affected, the homes that were lost. We're grateful that no lives was lost. So we pray for them, Father, as they are in that recovery mode now. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to assist and to help. And certainly with our prayers as well. Your will be done in this message today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, praise team. Let me just remind you that we will be uh, accepting a special offering next Sunday. Because right now they're still kindly assessing damages and we're trying to find out where the best place to funnel any givings that we might have. But some of you may have already given uh, online or something. That's okay too. But next Sunday, we will be, uh, after the services, we will be accepting a special offering that we will get uh, to uh, the areas that, that has a need, at least those that are close by. Turn in your Bible, if you will, today to, not to James 4, 1, but to Matthew, the third chapter, and we're going to be looking at the 13th through the 16th or 17th verses for our message thoughts today. Now, we aren't going to use the title. You won't be filling in the blanks today that is in your bulletin, but I do want to pose a thought for you to begin uh, maybe pra uh, praying about or searching your own heart uh, and would encourage you to read James 4, 1 through 10, or maybe the whole book of James, very short book. But the title of our message, What If? What if the things that are happening in our lives are around about or maybe even in our church, what if that's not someone else's fault? Quite a thought, quite a consuming thought. So I want to just plant that in your minds and then uh, do your reading and next Sunday, Lord's willing, we will present that message. Now let me, let me tell you why that we've changed the message today even after I left the church on Friday. We count, we've got five candidates that are going through the baptismal waters uh, at 11 o'clock. That means they have accepted Christ. That means they're beginning their journey. They're beginning their walk with Christ. And for the most part, these are young people. And then after I got home Friday evening, there were two other of our neighbor's grandchildren that on Wednesday in their Awana program as well, they had accepted Christ, and they wanted me to baptize them. And I was thinking that they were today to be baptized uh, here, but they couldn't get all of the family together in time, so that will be a later date. Whether it's here or not, I don't know. But that's why I began to think, well, maybe I need to talk about baptism again. It's been a while since we've touched that. It's been a while. So if you are one of the uh, folks that have been baptized a long time ago and you think that uh, this really is not that important to you to spend your worship time talking about that, uh, you can go ahead and take a nap. I won't holler at you to do that. But I, I think we're going to see some things here for those of us that have been baptized a long time ago may want to have a checklist and see if we're still living up to our contract with God. You know, we made a contract with God. We made a contract with Jesus Christ. 
He was a main instigator of that contract. And that is for us to always be reminded that Christ paid the price for our salvation. He died on the cross for our sins. And sometimes we get carried away in what we want to do and how we want to live our lives that we forget that it has cost Jesus Christ his life on the cross. His blood covered that. So just maybe, Ben, as we aren't baptizing here in this service, just maybe we can do some soul searching and see if there are places in our lives that maybe there needs to be some adjustments. Not to be saved, but in order that we might better fulfill that contract that we made with God through Jesus Christ when He died on the cross, when He offered us forgiveness, when He offered us grace, and then when He continues to love us and forgive us as we move through life. The passage of Scripture is not new to any of you <coughs> excuse me, that are in the house. So if you've already turned there, uh, Matthew's Gospel, the third chapter, uh, beginning at the 13th verse, and now John the Baptist has already come and preaching out in the wilderness. He was having uh, what we would call uh, maybe a tent revival without a tent. He was preaching. He was preaching uh, a message that people were being convicted of their sins, and they were being baptized by John. And one day, John was there, whether he was preaching or already in the water baptizing, and I kind of think that's where he was. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Taylor, you may go get me a little cup of water if you don't mind, please. He's already preaching or baptizing, and all of a sudden, he sees somebody coming. And that's where we're going to kind of pick up in the Scriptures. And he recognized that individual as being Jesus, who, first of all, was kin to John. But at the same time, at the same time, he was setting the stage of Christ coming. He was reminding the people, and, and remember this was largely a Jewish audience, and they were, their, their living for God was uh, obeying the Old Testament laws, which was difficult to do, and many, if any, were abiding by those laws. And John was preaching that, that we have a need, uh, we are, we, we, we are, uh, have inherited sin, and there's something that God needs to pay for that sin, and the man is coming, and his name is Jesus Christ. And my friends, he paid for your sins, and he paid for my sins as well. But when John saw him coming, <clears throat> when John saw him coming, here's the dialogue that kindly uh, went between them. Verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, unto John to be baptized of him. Jesus knew about John's baptism. Jesus knew that he was going to later baptize with the Holy Spirit of God, which you and I as Christians has received, and these that are going through the baptismal waters has received as well. But he knew that John was baptizing with water or baptizing in water. So Jesus was coming to John. <coughs> and in the 14th verse, and when John saw him, John forbade him saying, I need to be baptized of you and you're coming to me. That was a question. I know who you are. I need you to baptize me and here you are coming to me. If you ever wonder... Why water baptism is important to us in the 21st century? Right, here's the reason. Jesus Christ, 
who knew no sin came to be baptized to identify the need for baptism, for water baptism, and it doesn't save us. It is not an add-on after salvation. It is because of salvation, because that we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It is because of that. So Jesus Christ is saying to us today, to those of us that have gone through the baptismal waters, those that will be going through the baptismal waters, he's saying to us, this is something that you need to do, not for your salvation, but because of your salvation. Baptism is an important part of our walk with Christ. Verse 15, And Jesus answering John said unto him, Allow it to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Now, who was us? That was John. He was, he was the designated preacher of that time. And it was Jesus was the designated Savior at that time. He was headed to the cross for that. So who are the us today that behooves us to fulfill all of the righteousness of God? That, my friends, is you and me. It is you and me. So that's why when we watch these young people go through the waters today, it is a very important part of who we are. We are, by <clears throat> leading these uh, folks to Christ, by teaching them, and now by baptizing them, we are honoring Jesus Christ, and we are fulfilling or helping to fulfill the righteousness of God. So that's why baptism is important. That's why what we're doing today, even though we've already been baptized maybe years ago, that's why it's important that we are a part of this service. Because, listen to me, it is a part of God's plan. It is a part of God's plan. Verse 16, And Jesus was baptized. Seemingly, John didn't need a lot of convicting. Why was that? Because he was already appointed by God to lay the way for Christ coming, and this was a part of what he was supposed to do, and Jesus reminded him of that, that he wasn't just there because he was John. He was there because he was appointed by God to be John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. And we can carry that a little further. You and I aren't here today just because we're who we are. We're here today because God appointed us to be here and to help this church to be strong and to reach out in the community with the love of God, with the word of God, with the forgiveness of God. That's who we are. And that's why this particular message applies to you and to me, just as it applies to those that are being baptized today. And Jesus was baptized. And he went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. Do I believe the heavens were opened? I do. I believe the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Son of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Well pleased with Jesus by honoring the word of God, by honoring the commands of God, by beginning with the very simple thing as being baptized. This was the identifying the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He hadn't worked any miracles up to now, none recorded as we know of. He hadn't done any of that, but now it was time for him to begin. Now is time for these folks that will be going through the waters today. It is a beginning of their relationship with God. When you were baptized, when I was baptized, matter of fact, at six years old, that's been quite a long time ago, over 70 years. When I was baptized, I was beginning my relationship with God. And listen to me, every step of the way, 
Every step of the way, I decided what kind of relationship that was going to be. I decided if my relationship was going to be more like the prodigal son somewhere along the way, or I decided if my relationship was, more, uh, was going to be more like uh, John obeying the very word of God and the plan of God for his life, and my friends, that is the way you decide your relationship with God. You've heard me say from this pulpit a lot of times. Every one of us sitting in the house, we are as close to God as we choose to be. That's what that relationship is all about. We are as close to God as we choose to be. And, and I like the scripture where the heavens opened and the dove came down and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When you were baptized, my friends, regardless of when or where, when you was baptized, I think from heaven, that same thing. Maybe the heavens didn't open up. Maybe a dove didn't come down. But God was saying, hey, young man, hey, young lady, hey, older man, hey, older lady, I am pleased with what you have decided to do. I am pleased with your choice today. And he's saying the same thing with these folks that go through the waters today. I am pleased with your choice. All right, let's look a little bit now at an outline. And if, <coughs> excuse me, if you want to print this uh, in your bullet to print them out, you can. So what is water baptism and why is it so important? Number one, water baptism is an outward affirmation of the already accomplished inner transformation. When we accept Christ, we become a changed person in the same body with the same spirit, the carnal spirit. And we receive that Holy Spirit. So those two spirits are going to constantly war in our bodies. And don't tell me that they don't in yours. I know that they do. They do in mine as well. Why? Because the carnal spirit cannot get along with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot get along with the carnal spirit. That's why we say the things that we shouldn't. And we know right after what we've done. We do the things that we shouldn't and we know right after what we've done. That is those two spirits that are warring within us. So at the time of salvation, at the time of accepting Christ, you and I and these going through the waters were transformed from an old way of life to a new way of life or at least an opportunity to leave the old way of life and to live up in the new way of life or up to the new way of life. We all have that choice and we make them on a daily basis. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's what one of these spirits are saying. The spirit itself, that is the Holy Spirit of God. That is the third person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is the spirit that moves in with our spirit. But that spirit reminds us that we are the children of God. Not that we may be. Not if we are baptized. Not if we join a church. Not if we live good enough. No, God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, reminds us when we accept Christ that we are the children of God. Now, my folks, that's an awesome thought. In the permissive world that we live in today, knowing that God's Spirit has reminded us that we are the children of God. Do we always live like it? We don't. We don't. Whose fault is that? It's not God's fault. He's equipped us with all we need to live a godly life. It is that 
carnal spirit that is in our lives that begins to jockey with the Holy Spirit. And you've heard me say this before, and I don't apologize for repetitiveness. And the one we surrender to the most will be the strongest. Now you might say, well, how can my spirit, my carnal spirit, be as strong as the Holy Spirit? It never is, but the Holy Spirit will back off when we don't allow Him to be who He is in our life. And we, my friends, make that decision. We make that decision. Romans 8, 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That simply means what it is saying. As a child of God, we inherit everything that God has to offer. We inherit everything that God offered to Jesus Christ. And we know that he's at the right hand of God right now. And as I was thinking about this, I wondered if we were going to have a seat at the right hand of God. And probably not. That's not even an issue. But we do inherit the heavenly place where God, where Jesus Christ has gone to prepare for us. That becomes ours, not because of what we do, but because of what we did at the time of salvation. My friends, we should be more appreciative of what God allowed us to do and what Jesus did for us. What is water baptism? It is symbolically a funeral. It is symbolically a funeral. It is being symbolically. Now, this, this is only a symbol. What is happening today is only a symbol. But it is a symbol of being buried when we go under the water and when we come out buried and then raised again. Why do we do water baptism? Well, here's why. Because when you are buried, we don't just sprinkle a little dirt over your head. And I'm not talking down on sprinkling, not at all. I just believe that water baptism all the way under uh, is the proper way. But if you've accepted Christ, and you've accepted some other type of baptism, that doesn't mean you're going to be lost because baptism don't save us or lose us. It is a symbol. It is honoring God just like Jesus honored God when he went to John the Baptist to be baptized. Colossians 2, 12. But with him, buried with him. Buried with who? Buried with Jesus Christ. We don't have anything, any doubts about Jesus' burial as a Christian. We know that he died. We know that they came and got the body and they buried it. We understand that. So we are, when we are baptized, we are being buried with him in baptism. Symbolically, wherein also we are with him through the fruits of the operations of God who have raised him from the dead. Buried just as we, these, these folks will go under the water. As we went under the water go under the water, and just as they come out of the water, one day we are going to be resurrected as well. That is the next thing on God's calendar, is rapturing His church out of this sinful world. Water baptism. Water baptism is ident is, uh, identifies a living relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't change anything that we've done. <clears throat> but it identifies a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, these young people, you, you and I, when we accepted Christ, nobody forced us to do that. We chose to do that. And that is identifying or beginning a living relationship with Christ. That's why we do the things that we do. Not because we have to, because we choose to. And the same thing in our spiritual walk with God. It is identifying a living relationship with Christ. This is symbolic of that relationship. Just as Jesus Christ was baptized and he began his ministry, we are baptized to begin a walk, a relationship with Jesus Christ and God the Father as well. My question to me and maybe to you, how are we living up to that? Are we satisfied with where we are in our relationship with God? 
And only we, if we are not, if we examine ourselves and we are not, then only we can change that. God is wanting us to change it. But only we can change that relationship. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I love this verse. Therefore, if any man, and I'll just insert woman, boy, or girl, be in Christ. How do we be in Christ? We accept him. Then we become a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. What is passed away? Our carnal nature. I mean, we still have it, but we're letting that go. And then we're allowing the Spirit, or should be allowing the Spirit, to override our carnal nature. Colossians 2, 6. As you have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. That's kind of a command. That's kind of a command. Just as you have received the finished work of Christ on the cross, then we are to walk in our choice. And you are complete in Him. Sometimes I think here is why that we struggle so much that we have failed to realize that it is only Jesus Christ when we have chosen Him that we be complete in Him. And not what we do, but how that we trust Him and live for Him in our faith in Him. We are complete. And sometimes when we walk as the prodigal son walked, he was incomplete. He hadn't found what he was searching for. Have you and I found what we were searching for? If we haven't, I'll remind you today, it's in Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus Christ and nowhere else. Then what a baptism is a command of God. Is a command of God. Now let me remind before I put up some scripture. It is not an option. It is not an option. Let me show you. Let me show you why. How, how, where I'm getting that from. Now it's not for salvation. I hope I've already talked enough about that. But Matthew 28 and 18, we all know the scripture, Jesus preparing to ascend back into heaven. And he shared with the disciples and he's sharing with you and I today, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teaching them. I think we do a pretty good job at that, at least here. I've got, we, we've got good teachers in place in both Sunday school, Awana, youth, uh, Wednesday night Bible studies. We've got good people in place, good teachers. I think they're teaching the very Word of God. If I thought they wasn't, then we'd have a problem. So I, our job is, is to go beginning where we are and, and all over the world, and we do that throughout Southern Baptist uh, missionaries. I would warn you of that. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Not only teaching, but teaching is a command. We don't have a problem with that. But as I read the Scripture further... Baptizing of the teaching. Beside of the teaching. When the first church began after the Holy Spirit descended and, and Peter and the disciples were preaching, here's what, when, when the people were convicted of their sins, they came to Peter and the apostles saying, what in the world can we do? We know that we, uh, we, we, we are, are not living right. We, we're searching for something. What can we do? And here's what Peter said, repent. Repent and be baptized. Some of you. What? All of you? Oh my goodness, folks. Oh, my goodness. And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. You help me here. Every one of you. I kind of get that as nobody being left out. Now, again, we aren't talking about for salvation. We aren't talking about that. But we're talking about after salvation. And I think the first Decision that we make after receiving Christ is going through the baptismal waters. And then I think it's that we begin.
to make a difference, number one, in our lives. And if we don't make a difference in our lives, we're not going to make a difference in anyone else's life. But number one, in our lives and then in other lives as well. So I gather from those scriptures that it's not an option. Again, I want to remind you, it's not for salvation, but it is because of salvation. You know, when we do the things that we do because we have to, and we're coming up here pretty quick, and we're going to be appointing uh, teachers and officers committed. They're going to be looking for leaders. And if you're approached, don't take anything unless you feel like that you want to do that. You want to do something that pleases God. And teaching others certainly pleases God. Helping others certainly pleases God. But don't take it just because no one else will take it. I've, down through the years of my ministry, some here, some at other churches, I've heard people say, well, I'll take it if you can't get anybody else. I say to my teachers in the office committee then, well, don't take that person. If they're going to take it just because you can't get anybody else. But... Because of what Christ did for us, we want to do what we do. You're here today, not because you had to come. Maybe some of the smaller children may have. I know uh, I did when, when I was small and going to church. I realized that, and that's a thing of the moms and dads. But you're here because you chose to be here. That's why we come. That's why we sing. That's why we do the things that we do. Because we choose to do them because of what Christ did for us. We want to honor Him. So, I just finalize my message today with no visible baptism, but just with a question. Where are you in the contract that you made with God through Jesus Christ? Are you doing what you have to do or are you doing what you want to do for Christ? Father, thank you again for our time together. Thank you, Father, for, for, for the presence of the Holy Spirit that moves among us. Father, today as we examine ourselves through a message that sometimes we think it doesn't mean that much to us, but maybe we have done some soul searching. Your will be done at this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.